No. I like it. That's good, because there's going to be more of it. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Michael Morris, who is the CEO of Top Coder, uh, which is one of the largest on demand digital talent network of 1.6 million remote technologists in about 190 plus countries. Welcome to the show today, Mike. Well, thank you, Scott. Yeah, happy to be here. So, you've been on this journey for many years, and I think the genesis of that started back when you were with Aperio with Cloud Spoke specifically, and then I think that led to the acquisition of TopCoder. So if you could just kind of walk us through from the early days to what TopCoder is today, and specifically, I'm really interested also to get your perspective in terms of how has the labor market changed since you started this journey? Yeah, um, I'll keep it quick, but actually, I, I would trace this back all the way back to when I graduated college, really, is um, I work for a software company out of college, and I remember thinking, hey, if I take this job, what do I do after this project? And the answer was, well, you do the next release and the next release and then the next release. And I was like, well, that, that just does not sound like something I want to get into right now. So I went down the path of consulting um, and had a great time learning a bunch of different industries, trying new things, checking things out. And that's actually, it was right around the year 2000 when the concept of Top Coder came up. So it was, uh, it was this whole idea that, you know, what if we could find talent um, regardless of where it was and use it, right, at, to do bits and pieces of work. That's actually one of the concepts that we called it was bits and pieces, like just tapping into intellectual capital for a piece here or there. And, um, and a group of us started TopCoder uh, back in 2001. So that's really where the journey started. And it was all about at that time, I would sum it up as we just wanted to find the best technical talent. And we knew that if we did that part, we'd kind of figure out something valuable on the other side of it for the business. Um, and that was the concept of Top Coder. I ended up, as you mentioned, I left Top Coder and went to Aperio right about 2012, 2011, 2012, right before I think the end of 2011. And, um, and it was because I just wanted to, wanted to try something else. Um, and they had, uh, they had this concept of cloud spokes that they were just thinking of starting. Right. So it, it, it was, it was a new concept. Um, and I jumped into that to kind of help them grow that, help Aperio grow that. And we grew it really rapidly. The first year and a half, we went to about a, uh, a million dollars in revenue and close to five million in bookings for the next year. So it was growing incredibly rapidly. And so we knew we were onto something. At the time that that was happening, um, you know, uh, an opportunity came up to actually acquire Top Coder. So I was like, wow. You know, I know everything that's happened in Top Coder. I'm very familiar with the business. Um, Cloud Spokes is going great. And we saw an opportunity to be able to combine those two models together. They're both built on community models where you had a really global community of talent and you could tap into them to get work done on an outcomes basis. I'd say that's the most important thing. There are a lot of virtual models out there that just can assign you a resource and you work with that resource on an efforts-based model. Ours was always built to be an outcomes-based model. Like somebody produces something, you're buying that outcome, not the time it took them to create it. Um, so uh, so that, that was really what the journey was for me. And I, I would say that um, a lot has changed uh, significantly 
the biggest I would say that the change is really on the talent side. So when we started, you know, back in the early 2000s, freelancing wasn't a big thing. It st started to get more and more popular for very niche skills. And I'd say in around 2011, 2012, it really started taking off where you could find people that were high end in data science or design or very specific development skills were doing freelancing because they could control more of, um, you know, more of their uh, work uh, life, I would say. Um, and then, you know, as things have progressed, I think freelancing has just become a larger and a larger and a larger piece of, uh, of our economy um, as people want more freedom in what they do. So I think, you know, I think that's been the largest trend. I'd say the other one that I would point to as kind of going along is cloud. So public cloud really enabled this business. When we started, you kind of think of it, it's, it's almost like, it's almost archaic to even think you would do this. You'd build a piece of software with remote people on a set of servers that you owned, and then you'd send the software to somebody else, and then they would have to install it. Now with cloud, that really changed it where it's like you can have these remote resources working right inside the environments that the customer is going to take, um, the customer is going to use, or they're, they're even going to put into production. So cloud was the piece that I'd say had the biggest technical impact on our ability to scale the business. You know, it's, it's, it's fascinating because, um, you know, the conversation that we're having is the kind of content that will eventually go down in uh, history in terms of literally being chronologically, you know, written down because the timing uh, coincides with uh, really the, the growth of the Internet. And when I say growth, I mean really the, the genesis and the, uh, the early days when it was barely a, really a proper commerce platform uh, to... Uh, I think, you know, you didn't really go into too much detail, but during that time period, there was also quite a bit of changes also happening on the recruitment side, both on the tools and, you know, just just capabilities and I think movement away from, you know, large recruiting firms to even kind of gig, you know, gig recruiters as well, to some extent, I suppose. Uh, but it's interesting because your business really reflects well. Uh, it's almost like a, a concurrent, but also predictive indicator of what's happening in the bigger marketplace. So fascinating to to say the least. And I think one of the points that you call that is especially for millennials that are looking for that balance of a quality of life and of course the, the earned income and the flexibility to travel as well, to be able to work from anywhere. Uh, I think all of these things kind of contributed to the, the rise and the shared economy and the gig economy that we've seen in the last, uh, last few years. Uh, and then the other piece I think that's really interesting is that if you look at some of the case studies that are out there, whether it's, uh, you know, the Sanford professor who opened up the AI class uh, or other examples is that, you know, we, you know, this notion that great think tank, great minds and capabilities are only localized, I think, is a false statement. I, I, I'm curious to know from your perspective how this experience has really shown that some of the brightest and best capable uh, talent is truly distributed and dispersed throughout the world. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. It's, uh, as you said at the beginning, we're, we have 1.6 million people in our community. It's in over 190 countries. And we have the, um, the luxury of being able to put work out, typically, usually, without any restrictions. So it could be wherever, wherever you are and you have, there's a few things. It's not just the, the skill and the ability to do the work. It's also the passion to do the work, right? Somebody has the, the interest, the passion to do it. <clears throat> um, and we find that a lot of, a lot of skill sets do come geographically, usually because of the educational um, structure that they grew up in, right? So like the U S has great, great educational system. Some, some may disagree, but it's got a great educational system, especially at the college level. So there's a ton of talent in the U.S. pretty much across the board, creative talent, technical talent, uh, mathematical talent, problem solving talent. Um, but if I look at geographically, there are pockets of talent that are just really strong. So you want um, high-end development or data science, Eastern Europe is fantastic. 
You know, they have a great mathematical educational system. Uh, China, Asia, very strong. Um, and then you'll find other pockets, but there are main ones. I'll give you a really interesting one that is just statistically off the charts is um, Indonesia in that area of the world, the Philippines, um, creativity. So we see it in our design user experience. They win maybe three times more than any other region of the world. And our, on our creative, there's a lot of things we do are challenge-based where we go out the person that does the best job is going to get awarded um, that work or be able to transfer that IP. So it's really, it's pretty good data. It's clean data. Um, as an economist, you, you'd love to dig into it. Um, so it's really neat to see those, those pockets of talent. And, uh, and we, can, we can do that across, a, now a top coder, we probably have over 5 million, maybe over 6 million coding submissions we run tens of thousands of units of work per year. Um, and so our, our data is just amazing to be able to go back and look at, um, at where that talent comes from. And we can also do it from the perspective of where they're, where, so if there's, there's some talent, like um, I'll give you an example. If I look at um, some parts of the world they may try more to do certain type of work, but they succeed, let's say one out of three times. And then other parts of the world, they try, but they succeed two out of three times. That's a big difference, right? So, I mean, it means that, you know, the proficiency in a certain skill set, you can really be able to look at and say, wow, those people have, you know, really good fundamental skill sets. Um, but then the other thing that we've seen, we've been around for a long time. So we've actually seen the ability for people to learn from others. And that's also not geographically constrained. So we have a lot of people that have come into our community and they, one, one of our top members, um, he's actually originally from Russia. He now lives in Valencia, Spain. Um, his code name is Bird of Preru. And uh, he came in as a, uh, as a, as a chemist. That was his, uh, his, his educational background. And he learned how to do data science as his first. Then he became a really strong data scientist. And then he went into more of the digital technology sector. So now cloud development, mobile development. And uh, he's an incredibly strong developer. And he learned all of that through our platform by working with people that were better than him. And, uh, and now I, you know, I'm kind of proud to say he's, he's probably one of the you know, top one, two percent in that 1.6 million, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, actually, that's a, a fascinating point that I was going to actually ask myself is that because it's outcome based, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I think people may misunderstand is that those that are just learning, maybe they're fairly junior in their skill set and don't have the, the level of experience. Um, how are they able to really learn? And, and again, I think one of the key differentiation again is, you know, this model is very different from a, a BPO model. Uh, this is very different from, like you said, more like a, you know, effort model. Um, and, and at the same time, um, does it have elements of also competition and a war, right? So, so how, how do you balance in such a way that truly it's merit-based, but at the same time, the broad-based knowledge and the depth of knowledge grows at the community level uh, in addition to the individual? Yeah. So um, first I will say we have a part of our platform just dedicated to learning. So we call it Thrive. And you can go there and you can participate in pieces of work that have been established for learning. So you can, um, we call them learning challenges, and you can submit on them. You'll get graded and scored and you'll get that feedback. So you'll, you'll have the ability to go and try new things. So let's say you want to learn how to do blockchain great way to go do blockchain, take on a project to do it, get graded, get that feedback. Um, you want to learn cogn cognitive AIs inside of an application, right? How to use cognitive thinking um, in a digital app. Another set of learning opportunities that we have. <clears throat> Computer vision, all sorts of other types of uh, machine learning, neural algorithms, um, things like that that you can, you can dive into. However, that's been a fairly new thing that we've added over the years, there's always been this element of learning while you're working. So um, many things we do, probably 
maybe it, it might be a, a, as much as about 30% of the work on Top Coder is in the form of a competition where you register, you see who else registers, you have the background of everybody, so really rich profile information. And as you're working on a project, um, we never just, we always pay more than one place. So there's always a, a first, second, third, sometimes in like a, an algorithm match, there might be up to 10 places that we pay. So different prize amounts in a creative competition, usually three, four, five, six types of, um, so there's a, there's a good chance that you're going to get uh, compensation for it. But at a minimum, you are getting the, uh, this amazing feedback. And when you ask a question, this is a, this is a phenomenon that, um, I call it competitive collaboration. Uh, you would be amazed at the person that you're competing against is so, uh, it's, it's, they always answer the questions, right? Somebody will come in and say, Hey, I really don't understand how to do X, Y, and Z. Any thoughts on this? And they'll get all the, all the other people working on it are going to help them. And I, I do, I, I kind of think of it as, you know, I think technical people, the one thing they like more than winning is showing how smart they are <laughs> and they love to be able to answer questions. So they almost can't resist help helping. So it's a really neat culture that has grown inside of the community. And we, we kind of pride ourselves in number one, there's never any IP that changes hands without payment for that IP. That's, that's kind of a core rule of top coder. And uh, number two, we, we minimize the amount of people that don't get, compensated so like in development it's in a development competition um it's maybe like you know 0.3 percent of the of the work that gets submitted will not get compensated and that's only going to be because it didn't meet certain criteria right it didn't it got graded down in certain criteria so it's we're we're very good at at uh kind of managing that supply and demand curve in our community again just because of all the data that we have um but then once you get in once you kind of earn your profile, that then opens up a ton of other opportunities for you. You can become a reviewer on our platform. You get paid to do reviews and score other people, and you have to maintain a certain rating and credibility to do that. You could become a co-pilot. A co-pilot is, uh, is somebody that actually manages streams of work. So if somebody comes to us and says, hey, we want to build an algorithm to detect um, to detect where a where to apply radiation in a uh, 3D scan, and um, th that stream of work will be managed by somebody in our community. They will break it down into pieces. They will launch the challenges. They will bring the people in. They will put the tasks out, um, and then you get open to other other work that might be specific to a set of customers. So a customer may say, you know what, I want to work with these resources that competed on this project. Right. They prove their skill sets. I'd like to put them in a pool of people that I can use on, on an ongoing basis. So there's a lot of career advancement opportunities, even in a gig model like Top Coder, where it's just community-based. So technically, you're not getting a promotion, but you unlock and open these other opportunities that you earned yourself into. Absolutely agree. Uh, I want to ask in terms of um, how Top Coder coexists with other developer communities. And I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, vibrant communities from open source to, you know, um, to whether it's Linux Foundation related projects to even GitHub uh, to others that are very, very active. And I wonder how they both kind of feed in in terms of uh, supply, but also how are some of the models out there changing and also changing the competitive landscape as well? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the way that I look at developer community, successful developer communities are able to engage both the hearts and the minds of their developers. And, uh, and there have, in my opinion, there haven't been that many that have successfully done that. GitHub, I think, is a great example of one. It's just a, they have the hearts and the minds of the developer community. People love going to GitHub. It's a part of their everyday life. It's not a tool. It's not a set of productivity tools. It's a place to go to work, right? That's really what it's become for developers in a virtual setting. Um, we, are, we are an open door. Like if you, if you think that you control or own a community in this day and age, you're going to find yourself with no community. Um, and we learned that very early on at Topcoder. I mean, when we started 
you know, there, there wasn't social networks, weren't a thing. There wasn't a Facebook. There wasn't, you know, the closest thing was bulletin board groups. And we, we actually, we took a lot of lessons from the international chess foundation. They had a great online community, but there wasn't much else out there today. There's a ton. So we believe in a very open philosophy and community. Um, if other communities want to have access to our community and it's right for our community, we're fine with that. It doesn't have to go through us. We don't have to earn money on it. If our community goes and finds an opportunity somewhere else, that's great. Cause you know what, they're going to come back. Um, and that's, that's kind of the way that we look at it so much so that one of the big things that we're pushing, uh, now is this whole concept of, um, open ID. So if you work on the top cutter platform, you have to go through certain checks, right? You know, minimum, you've got to do your, um, your confidentiality NDAs and things like that, your country of residence, your equivalent of your 1099 forms, or whatever it is you have to go through to be able to be paid. Um, maximum, you could go through background checks, security scans, um, even clearance, right? Or regulations, or even for, um, for, uh, for comp uh, audit companies, you may have to do independence checks. So there's a lot of things that you could go through as a freelancer. We believe that that should be an open ID. That shouldn't be <clears throat> my property as top coder. That should be the person, the community member's property. And it should be part of a, call it a wallet, that they can take to other platforms. So if you go through top coder and you earn, you earn credentials, you earn uh, badges, you earn ratings, and you also get background checks and things like that, why not allow them to go bring that to another platform so they can continue using it and working it and building upon it? Um, I really, it's something that you know, we've implemented, uh, we've built it, we're now getting other platforms to adopt it. Um, we haven't had a ton of success <clears throat> yet, but we will, because at the end of the day, I think it makes, it makes sense for the, for the talent. And that that'll be that'll be what drives it. Yeah, I think uh, I think it makes perfect sense. And and from a uh, you know kind of a needs uh, based strategy point of view, to really think about the holistic needs, because ultimately they're not only the the creative talent in the workhorse, but you know they are a contributing member, a vibrant member of that community. So anything that helps aid them um, in this notion of you know truly freelancing across, not just uh, you know, physical territories, but also different communities. I, I think that's spot on. And of course, it has elements of, you know, could have elements down the road of blockchain as well as some privacy elements as well. So very, very intriguing. Um, I want to transition the conversation for the few remaining minutes that we do have, uh, which is then looking at it more from the enterprise side, but also the, the freelance perspective. On the enterprise side, they themselves have gone through quite a bit of, I think, changes over the years, you know, whether it's outsourcing, BPO to, um, you know, various other forms, including having consultants, uh, whether it's uh, onshore or offshore consultants on site. Uh, for them, I think the, the rationale, it makes a lot of sense. You know, it's merit based. It's based on results. And, and certainly when it comes to, you know, code or algorithms, it, th there's a certain degree of uh, to some extent, ability to measure uh, superiority, um, you know, relative to kind of the mean. So that kind of makes sense. Um, and certainly from a cost structure of not having to have uh, the full salaried employees from an HR benefit and so forth makes a plenty of sense as well. I guess the question is for the, the freelancers, does it really make sense? And again, I, I keep in mind, I know that the freelance um, and the gig economy is here to stay, but where what situations does it not make sense for a freelancer to continue this path versus having more of a, a tr traditional type of an employment model yeah um I mean, so there are two giant holes today and one is uh well they're, they're the health and the wealth benefits to me like, I think those are really two big holes, especially if, you know, it's very much dependent per country, right? And to learn what, what your options are for health benefits <clears throat> or retirement benefits. Um, that's one of the biggest things that, like, to, to, that, that, you know, I think there were more prior, 
you know, to the last year or so. But I think that health and wealth benefits are really big um, factor in whether somebody should go down this path. Um, and if you, you know, if you just look at your own, I look at my circles, including my, my own family, you know, my wife is a freelancer, <clears throat> but I have a full-time job, right? So I have the stability and the benefits and things like that. And you find that pretty common in the U S especially with families, <clears throat> excuse me. But, um, I, you know, I think that that issue needs to be solved. It's something that's on our radar. We think that platforms like TopCoder should be some of the, the companies that help to push these solutions in place um, where there is a, a vehicle that can provide those health benefits. So I think, I think that's a big, a big piece of it. Well, I wish we could continue. I, we had a lot more questions to cover, but our time is up for today. So I've been joined by Michael Morris, who is the CEO of Top Coder. Thanks for joining today. Thank you, Scott. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.